Before we begin, I want to tell you about a YouTube channel which I think you'll really enjoy. It's named after the host, Daniel Green, and it's all about fantasy, okay? Fantasy books, what's ha happening in fantasy in general, fantasy reviews, breakdowns, summaries, deep dives, all the really, really great things. He has this awesome series called Fantasy News, where he actually keeps you updated on a wide breadth of many things happening in the fantasy world in media generally, because there's a lot of other channels that talk about uh, movies specifically. Daniel, he looks at anything that's in fantasy, whether it's books, movies, TV shows, authors, comic books, adaptations, if it's fantasy, he is your man, and he is just really funny as well. So his presentation is fun, entertaining, and he is also very insightful on top of that with his reviews as well. So please, go check him out, give him a subscribe, because he's definitely all worth it. I'm subscribed, love his content, and I think you will as well. Greetings, I'm Shad, and in this video it's my intention to try and break down some of the classic types of medieval garments so you can know and have a bit of a reference that you can look at as to what are they called? Because that's actually been a difficult thing for me to figure out over the years of my medieval interest because there's a couple of go-to things that people know, like uh, uh, tunics, tunics, cloaks, um, and, and, and surcoats, tabards, because we see them in fantasy. I have a whole video on the bards, by the way, where it does not mean what they think it means. I want to do the quote from Princess Bride. That's a tabard. You keep using the word. I do not think it means what you think it means. Anyway, it's a good video, okay? But you see a wide range. When I say wide, it's actually more specific that I've been able to discover than you might suppose, I, I, with actual specific names. But the tricky thing is, what I have also found, is that a lot of these names have a decent amount of overlap, where one garment could easily be identified as one or the other. And I'm going to go into that and try and share some of uh, the specifics, and also some of the confusion as to what might overlap, and perhaps points of distinction that we can make. Now, the purpose of this video is to talk about garments, specifically things that you wear over your arms and chest, and not hats, okay? Hats are their own fashion thing in the medieval period. I'm not talking about boots either, okay? These are primary garments, undergarments, main garments and outer garments as well. Outer garments like coats and things. What are they called? And uh, I'll try and share where you find them and things. And so we'll start with the undergarment. And honestly, you could just call it that, okay? You could just call it an undergarment. But another word is shirt. Yes, and shirts did exist in the medieval period. More often than not, okay, especially in the early medieval period, shirts were an undergarment. And they were a bit long, but the shirt is specifically something that you wear on your skin. And it's the thing that's going to get the most smelly and dirty because it's on the skin, picking up all the skin particles and things and sweat and oils and things. And so you would wear that in between that and your main garment so you wouldn't have to watch, wash the main one as much. Now the other thing about the shirt being uh, the undergarment is that if they're short, they can be short, they can be longer, it, it varies, okay. Uh, you would wear it underneath because your main garment for a lot of the you know medieval period is going to be longer. I have a whole video uh, just sharing the funny fact that what we would identify as dresses in the modern day are actually unisex. They were not identified to any particular sex for the large majority. There are absolutely were fashion differences between men and women in the medieval period, but the length of the garment wasn't actually one of them for a large portion, okay? So watch that video if you want the details there. But having a long garment actually served a functional purpose in the medieval period, and that's the matter of keeping in heat, okay? Especially if you laid it with pants on top of that, it would keep you decently warm. And there's, I forget the guy who made the video, I watched it a long time ago, but he he, he does survival things and he tried wearing a medieval tunic in the snow and he found that it actually served really well to keep him warm. It was made out of wool. That wool thing also served to keep you warm. But because it was longer, it kind of trapped the heat in even better. So that's actually one of the reasons why, even for guys, a decent number of the garments were longer. But there's actually some other interesting reasons as well. And this is something that I neglected to mention in the other video, but I think it's also really uh, significant to mention as to why dresses or dress-like garments, people say robes, I'm going to talk about the robe dress, you know, um, comparison just in a sec. But that dress-like garments were also worn by men and women, and that's because they actually can fit a larger range of sizes. Pants, to work functionally, generally need to be tighter fit, and if they're not tight, they're going to fall down, which means you need a belt to hold them up. You don't need to do that. With a garment that's dress-like, you slip your arms through, hangs down, and it will fit a wider range of sizes. And I even found that recently in my other video, where I'm actually wearing 
I call it a surcoat, and by medieval definitions, it is a type of surcoat. I'll give you the details when I'm going through the specific garments a bit later on in the video. But people who are watching that video said, Shad, you shouldn't really call that a dress. That is clearly a robe, okay? It's made to fit a guy. It's a robe. This is a, this is a funny thing about that. It's my wife's dress, and I'm not kidding, okay? I, I don't know where to buy something like that. I needed a dress-like thing, and my wife bought several medieval dresses from Arm Street uh, for the Abbey Medieval Festival that we went to. So I went to my wife and asked her which is the one that is the most unisex one that she has that is not really made for, you know, it doesn't have the frills and attachments for women. And she's like, oh, this is this one. And I put it on and it actually fit really well. And that's the interesting thing about dresses being more unisex is because, absolutely, there's a big difference in height between me and my wife. Yet I could still wear that, not a problem. In fact, it, it, that might be why people thought it looked more robe-like because it wasn't dragging along the ground. And if you want to know one of the distinctions for a dress-like garment uh, to help to identify it in the medieval period for a man over a woman is if it you know, dragged along the ground. And of course, that was also a sign of, uh, you know, wealth as well, because if you could afford a dress dragging along the ground, generally means you weren't trudging through mud and other stuff. Um, and you wouldn't want to go to work in something that was dragging along the ground as well. And so because I'm taller than my wife, the her dress actually was a bit higher. People were looking at it like, that's a robe. It's you keep using the horse. And that's what I mean about the uh, robe dress comparison is that the only way you could then make a distinction is by the gender wearing it, not the cut or fit of the actual garment itself. Because when you look at these artworks and everything like that, the cut and fit, that is a dress by our modern standards. But of course, in the medieval period, they didn't think of it as a gendered type of garment. So you could call them robes if they're on men and dresses, but going to the root word dress, okay? Dress originally, just by the different ways in which we use the word, we can understand must have been a unisex term because what do we say when you are putting clothes on? You are getting what? You are getting dressed, okay? And we say that for men and for women. You are now dressed or you're going to go get dressed. You're in your formal dress, okay? Formal dress is required and that can be used to refer to men and women, but sometimes you just say formal attire instead of formal dress. But you know, so, so that we still use dress in a unisex term to imply that the original use of the term dress was also unisex, okay? It's only when, as things progressed, women more often wore dress like garments, men less so. And I actually think that perhaps comes down to work, okay? Who's out in the fields working more often? Women worked in the fields as well, a lot in the medieval period. But when it comes to really hard manual labor, guys are the ones who always end up doing that. And dresses can, we can see, get in the way. You don't want a large piece of your material getting caught in something. Pants getting associated with hard, heavy labor. And uh, of course that then gets associated with men and dresses being associated with women as well. So we see a distinction as time progresses. But medieval period, very much the same. Now, with all that, you know, interesting discussion, let's talk about the specifics. We've talked about the shirt, and the shirt could be long, also short, all right? It was in the medieval period. If uh, you were wearing just a shirt, you know, be like wearing a singlet, uh, I would say in the modern day. It's not like people would say, why are you wearing your underwear? You technically would be, but you could wear it on a hot day, just your shirt, and you'd be fine, and that is still medieval dress. Now, for a longer, okay, undergarment that is meant to be worn on the skin, that would be called a chemise. Now, a chemise in the modern day is distinctly a female undergarment because it's a dress, but guys could wear it as well if they wanted a particularly long one on top of that. And yeah, that is called a chemise. Now, the words that I'm using right at the moment, some are clearly based on certain cultures, like there are French words, all right? And these are, then have been adopted into other language that we now use them in the modern day. And I don't know what these items of clothing could have been called in different cultures. Now, uh, most likely would have been called the same in, say, English, because English adopts a lot of French. Greek, oh, like it's a, just a combination. But if you're looking at like what these things would have been called in the Germanic regions of medieval Europe, probably most likely a very different word. I don't know what they are. I just know the words that we ended up using adopting in English. And that's what I can share with you. Cause I believe chemise is also French. Oh, don't quote, I don't. There are some words I know are French chemise. I actually don't know. It sounds French to me when I hear it, but anyway. So the next garment I'll talk about after these two uh, undergarments that I've just mentioned is the tunic. Now, before I get onto tunics, the idea of a gown, you could technically call a lot of these ones gowns. A tunic is a type of gown, but Gown is a gendered word now. We, uh, you know, generally hear when we hear gown, we hear we think of a dress or something that a, you know, a woman would wear. And so uh, I'll just use garment. Right? And uh, the next garment is tunic. Tunic is a very broad term, okay? And uh, and you know, long sleeve, short sleeve, knee length, ankle length, okay? A lot of different overlap. 
buttoned, unbuttoned. Now that's where we come to the first bit of distinction. From my research, it seems tunics, most often, no buttons, okay? If it has buttons, you would generally call it something else. There's overlap, right? and, th and this is the confusing part. But okay, so tunics are fairly well understood. If, the, if it only comes down to here, we wouldn't generally call it a tunic, we'd call it a shirt, wouldn't we? Uh, did they do that in the medieval period? I don't know. It's really hard to find out. But if we're adapting it into the modern day, I think that's a perfectly fine distinction. So far, things have been fairly straightforward and understandable. But now we're getting to one of the more, I wouldn't say exotic, because uh, this is very much, you know, European history. But it's exotic in the sense that it's a word not many people really know and identify. I mentioned in the other video, and I said I didn't know how to pronounce it. And I'm very grateful for people sharing with me how it is pronounced. I pronounce it Blionde because it's like spelt with a T. But no, they said, Shad, it's pronounced Blionde. <laughs> that sounds like a very French word. It is a Blionde. No, oh, it's a Blionde. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Anyway, so the Blion. It's awkward for me to say it and it's hard for me to the, like what's the plural of Blion? 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 Bliet? Bliet? It's actually easy for me to say Blion Blont or something like that. So I'm probably gonna be throwing that T in just with the help of my own pronunciations because then I can add an S for plural. Blonts, Blionts, I don't know. So anyway, this is tricky because I can share you examples of what comes up as you know historically what is a Blion. But there's another garment that this one has a lot of overlap. There are so some that have such overlap that you could almost call it a bouillon or this other one and uh, you wouldn't really have an issue. And that is the hoopland. Now it's tricky with these terms. You can look them up and you can find Wikipedia articles that gives you a basic breakdown, but they're not detailed enough and it's hard to find really good information. Then you find conflicting information. Where you go online, you search a bouillon or you search a hoopland and they and a garment comes up which almost looks identical to what someone else called they, like they're saying this is a hoopland but that's what that looks identical to a bleon and so there, there is a lot of clear overlap but there were some trends that i was noticing in my research the uh, hoopland seemed more often to be an outer garment a type of coat that you would wore wear sorry <laughs> when you're going out into uh the elements and things keep yourself really warm this is your overcoat okay whereas the bleon looked like a primary garment, okay? Now, the difference between a bleon and a tunic, and this applies to the hoopland, is the size of the sleeves. Uh, one of the distinctions between the hoopland and the bleon, it looks like more hooplands were represented having longer sleeves. When I say long, I mean really long. Both these garments, the bleon and the hoopland, are uh, unisex, worn by both men and women. But when you get later into the medieval period, so we're talking about the 15th century, they're more seem to, seemingly identified with female type garments, or the female variants had very feminine, distinct features. Low cut, pronouncing the bust, really, really long arms, and the ones that the guys were wearing, less guys were wearing them towards the end of the medieval period, and the arms weren't hugely long, but there are examples of guys, you know, arms on these things really, really long. And so the primary distinction between the Blion and the Hoopland compared to the tunic is buttons down the front. If it's buttoned up, all right, all right, it would fall into one of these categories with an exception, because uh, the, the primary identifying thing is the length of sleeves. If it has short sleeves and is buttoned, not metal buttons, cloth buttons in the medieval period far more predominantly, like metal buttons, that's like a huge extravagance, okay? And it wasn't particularly long, came down to say the thighs, about right here, it's not a bleon, it's not a hoopland, it's another type of garment which I'll get to. But the bleon on the hoopland doesn't necessarily need to have, it could be no buttons, but if it has those long sleeves and it's going to the knee or all down to the ankles, it's not a tunic, more accurate to identify it as a bleon, now, again, more distinctions between the Blion and the Hoopland. Like I said, primary garment. What does a primary garment mean? It's like um, not as many folds, not as loosely fitting, okay? Generally, a, a bit tighter fit, still longer sleeves. That is the trend that I've been finding that helps me more distinctly identify a Blion. And the Hoopland is more swimming, more, you generally more folds, more room underneath. It's an overcoat, very fashionable. And uh, sometimes both of these could be, have, you know, full brocades uh, presenting really fancy in, uh, at times. And let me just jump on the idea, the notion that these fancy garments, the Bleon, the Hoopland, the Jupon, I'll get to all these other ones, the Tabard and everything were worn by higher ups and the peasants were only restricted to tunics and that was it. That's incorrect, okay? I, and, uh, 
doesn't take too much thinking to figure out because these, you know, the medieval peasants, they were resourceful, they were industrious, they worked hard, okay? And if they're in a position where they could make their own clothes, which many could, all right, they knew how to work a loom, they knew how to make cloth and they knew how to sew, they could make clothing that reflected these other styles. In actual fact, ah, uh, gee, when did I when did I come upon this research? It was a more credible source. And this is the thing, I have like long research sessions where I'm reading all this stuff. And generally I'm after one specific thing and I find all this other information while I'm looking for this thing. And this is a bad habit. I tend to just read past the things until I find what I'm after and then I say the thing I'm after. But I log away all these other things I've read, but then I've lost the, I've lost the sources. And even though they were good, credible ones, it's like, ah. And sometimes people ask me, Shay, can you share your sources? I'm like, I lost it. I read it, it was good. It was a, like, it was a good, accurate one. I just can't, can't remember or find where it came from, okay? And this is another one of those things where I've read an account, okay? It's a good, accurate account. Peasants wearing you know, really fancy clothing and being mistaken as noblemen. And there were some instances, and this is why it would be really, so share in the comments if you know the specific one, where in one of the medieval kingdoms or countries, might've been in England, France or something, uh, some of the nobles outlawed peasants wearing certain types of clothing so they wouldn't be misidentified as noblemen, <laughs> okay? <laughs> because, know your station, stay in your station. But what's really instructive about that is that that shows that peasants were absolutely wearing fancy clothing when they were in the, had the means to make it or purchase it okay just because you're a surf doesn't mean you can't get an income and I mentioned a while I've got a surf video coming and that's the, like I, I've gotten more there's been more traction there I've got some academic papers I need time to just read in depth because that's some, and uh, it's confirming my suspicions already these academic papers that we really misunderstand serfdom. It's not like slavery. They had a lot more freedoms than we generally you know, think of when we hear the term serf. And this is just another reference point that I found in multiple different you know, studies of my interests and things of peasants, so even serfs, having, being more educated, having more freedom, having more means and money than we think. And I say they weren't rich, obviously, but they were rich enough to be able to support themselves adequately quite well. And in some instances, buy really extravagant fancy clothing to the point that they were being mistaken as noblemen. And so we've just talked about the Lyon and the Hoopland, okay? There is a type of garment that predates the Hoopland, which is very Hoopland-like, and uh, this one is like, is that a Lyon or a Hoopland? People say it's the version of the Hoopland, okay, the earlier version of the Hoopland, but it looks very much like the Lyon as well. And that is the Herigot, 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 like how you spell it right there. So, um, like you could use that in lieu of these terms. It's the early, it's an earlier version. If you Google it, you'll find some interesting hits and they just like Hoopland, Blion, Herigot, hard to say. So the Blion and the Hoopland, just uh, another thing, uh, the length can be knee length to ankle length, as I mentioned, but if it's shorter, I've never found any examples of either of these garments being waist length. Remember, for a lot of reasons, not just fashion, that uh, waist length garments weren't common in the medieval period except towards the very end of the medieval period. There we find waist length garments, uh, but in the early medieval period, I don't say early and middle, this is the thing, there is an incorrect notion uh, that Garments across the broad medieval period got shorter as the medieval period progressed. And even I have said that, and for general primary garments, there is some truth to it. It's not wholly incorrect, but the idea that full length garments weren't worn in the later end of the medieval period, that's incorrect, okay? Uh, there's a lot of artwork and examples showing full length garments absolutely being worn. Uh, some being overcoats, okay? Wearing over armor. Like, have a look at some of these images. Like, these technically are at the very end at the very beginning of the uh, Renaissance, and so it's the transitional period. They're like uh, 1500 something, okay, 1505 these pictures date to, to 1550. At the very beginning of the Renaissance, which means they obviously bled over into the medieval period as well, and so they're representative enough for the late medieval period garments, and look how long they are. And some have the split to present the codpiece, but other garments got really short to present the codpiece as well, because the codpiece is one of those things, fashionable things that came in in the mid late medieval period. So anyway, going back to the Hoopland, that's the matter about length. Now we can move on to the next garment, which are very much the dress-like garments that in the modern day, if someone was wearing them in the mo like today, we would call them a dress. Uh, and you know, it would be very odd to see a guy wearing them. And that is the kirtle and Surcoat. Yes, the surcoat. The surcoat is an interesting one, as I mentioned in my other video, is because isn't that the garment knights wore over their mail? Yes, but there is also a version of the surcoat, very common, that people just wore casually as a primary garment. When I say primary, surcoat is 
you know, coat over top, usually over top of a tunic or a chemise, undergarment, any number of things, okay? Uh, but the surcoat is interesting because it is distinctly, the, the definition, the difference between a surcoat and a kirtle is no sleeves. When I say no sleeves, like either the sleeves cut short or no sleeves at all. There does seem to be a type of distinction between what you would more classically identify as a female type of surcoat that I've not seen any kind of images and things of men wearing this type. And that is the opening for the arms being really, really long and open. Sometimes hanging down quite low, even lower, and sometimes even cutting in really kind of you know, considerably on the side and then hanging down like they're wearing a weird type of apron. Only ever seen women wearing that type of circuit, and that is actually called a type uh, a circuit, okay? And uh, for the guys, there is uh, the knightly type of circuit, and that, you know, if it has a split down the middle, generally there for riding a horse, but doesn't need to have a split down the middle to be considered a circuit. It needs to be actually a dress like garment without sleeves, okay? That's a circuit, and guys wearing them as well in the medieval period. And the surcoat generally an outer garment that you would wear over something else because it's not, it's, it doesn't have sleeves and sleeves keep you warm and so any type of garment that has sleeves would be something you wear as a primary garment usually because if it's hot I'm sure someone could just wear a surcoat and be perfectly fine but so more often than not you'd wear a tunic or a kirtle underneath. Kirtle is like your classic iconic medieval dress you could say worn both by men and women in the medieval period thing defining a female kirtle versus a male kirtle type of cut, where it's tight, where it's loose, different things like that, how low the cut is as well. Next garments are interesting and before I go on to them I do want to say this isn't an, an exhaustive list unfortunately. I still come across certain you know garments where I was like that doesn't look, look like it falls into the perfect categories and I don't know the name of them. Like certain types of uh, dresses that were really low cut that have certain you know things or frills at the top. Is it a hoopland? But hooplands tend to be an outer garment. That looks like a primary dress garment. It's got the long sleeves. Would you call it a bliant? I don't know. It's hard to like dress. But dress in the medieval term was a unisex term just meant clothing really and says so like what do you call it you know. So if people know Comments down below, please. It, like the person who gives the most exhaustive comment with good sources of additional garments that I failed to mention in this video, I will pin that comment to the top. And so hopefully there'll be something cool that you guys can go down and read and get further information on. So the next one I'll mention is the gambeson. Now the gambeson is armor. Okay? It's a type of textile armor, padded, but it was adopted and worn for ca casual dress as well, thinner because it became, uh, became fashionable, okay? So, um, uh, when people wear something enough and people see other people wearing it, it's like, oh, I can see that looks pretty cool. I'll wear it too, just not going to war and things. And so the gambeson has a lot of different cuts and variants, okay? It can be sleeved, it can be unsleeved, as I'm wearing right here. I'm wearing an unsleeved one over, it's a technically a tunic, you could call it maybe a blion. I'd call it, I'll call my you know tunic thing a blion over a hoopland, but puffy sleeve tunic is probably even more accurate because that's closed at the uh, at the wrist where blions and hooplons seem to be open quite considerably at the wrist, which is why it's probably better just call what I'm wearing underneath puffy sleeve tunic. Um, and yeah, gambeson. Gambesons can be right down to your ankle. Uh, or down to things. They can be you know strapped up like with buttons or belts open or closed completely. So yeah, lots of different variants. The thing that would define a gambeson is if it's padding, okay? If it's padded of some kind, it has either stitching to identify it. Because if it doesn't have that padded look, there actually wouldn't be a gambeson. You, you could call it a tunic, okay? Like for instance, picture a surcoat, okay? Like what a knight wears and replace it with a padded type of thing. Suddenly it's a gambeson, even though it's got the same cut as a surcoat. Picture a tunic replace it with padding. It's a gambeson now, okay? And so the gambeson is a more broader term that applies to lots of different cuts and types of outfits. That's interesting because that seems to be another point of distinction for another type of garment that is uh, the weird kind of crossover thing between armor and regular clothing, and that is the jupon. The jupon is a tricky thing to try and identify because uh, when I see uh, things called jupons, uh, certain, you know, versions, I look and say, that's almost exactly what you would call a tabard. The tabard itself is very misunderstood. I've already mentioned I have a video talking about details because in pop culture, 
What people more often define or identify as a tabard is not a tabard. It's actually what is called a monastic scapula. A bit of a the type of clothing. It's not actual clothing. It's an outer kind of adornment, really. A single strip of cloth that's, that's narrow, doesn't go broad, that's narrow, and comes down to hang in front of, you know, your legs and behind. That is a monastic scapula. Worn by, you know, monks in the medieval period, but also worn by people as, an, a, fas as a type of fashionable kind of addition. Uh, if it still carried certain religious significance, I would assume it did, and they're wearing it to, you know, um, present a type of religious devotion of some kind. But I found two medieval artworks, one on a guy, one on a woman, and what they're wearing? Those are monastic scapulas over regular dress, okay? And then don't look to be like monks. So uh, they were also worn. Those are not tabards, okay? A tabard is a type of outer garment. This is an outer coat specifically, all right? That you would wear over top anything else without anything over on top of that. Generally, they were worn to present a coat of arms, okay? Uh, crest, uh, the sigils and things. Um, a type of uh, device in heraldry. But uh, one of the best examples of a proper tabard or tabard, depending on how you pronounce it. I say tabard, I just, I like the sound of it better. Maybe it's because I'm Australian. Tabard, tabard, I don't know. Anyway, is the ones that the Three Musketeers wore. You know, the, the blue thing, the Three Musketeers, that's a proper tabard, okay? Uh, doesn't need to have sleeves. Uh, the Musketeers one don't, they actually have slits on the opening uh, and it comes through so they have flaps that hang down on the sides, but it doesn't need to have flaps. And this is where the tabard, I feel, got confused with the monastic scapula because there are a version of tabard that's just a front flap and a back flap, but the distinction is that they're wider, they're almost bell-shaped, they kind of come down and they're wide because they present the coat of arms and they only stop at about here. I haven't found many, no, I haven't found any instances of a tabard going down to your shin or ankles. The longest ones come down to your knees, but most come down to about the thighs, actually. And so that's distinctly a tabard and can be worn in casual dress, but also worn as a, a, a thing item to display heraldic symbols and devices. Now, what's interesting about that is uh, there are types of jupons that look very much tabard-like, which is just a front flap and a back flap. And so what's the difference? This is the thing about the jupon. The jupon can sometimes be somewhat gambeson-like, where you look at it as like, that, that's padded, that's a type of padded armor. This is where the jupon acts as a type of armor. French knights did wear the jupon as an additional type of layer uh, of protection, and sometimes not as protection at all. They would wear it over armor as just to make them look fancy and look great. And the idea that when you wear full plate armor, it's just, you have to have the metal out. No, no, in the medieval period, people loved decorating their armor so it wouldn't just be plain steel. It actually seems to be the thing that wearing plain steel seemed to be plain. Exactly that. Uh, and they liked painting it. They liked adorning it with uh, gold, you know, inlays and things like that. And they liked wearing clothing over top of it that looked even better. And so the types of clothing that they generally wear on top of armor, what we see, you would either call a tabard or a jupon. All right, how do we get some distinction between the difference between the two? Uh, if it's padded, okay, and acts as a type of armor, seems like that is what people do more define as a jupon. Tabards, from my, you know, analysis and study, I didn't find any instances of people referring to them as a type of armor. That's one distinction you can make there. Another distinction, if they're open at the sides or closed. Uh, it seems like if it's sewn in on the sides and it's actually a full garment that comes, you know, closed you know, there, that would then be a jupon. Whereas tabards, more classically open, they have the front flap and the back flap. So again, good points of distinction. Though I have found ones that are closed or open that have been called the other, but I'm just gonna go with those points of distinction there to help us know the difference. The cool thing about jupons is that there's many examples of them having these full brocades and worn over armor, and they just look stunning. Like, oh, just amazing. Now, I, uh, there are other garments, okay? Like uh, these ones that are, these are portraits of Bavarian dukes that date from like 1505 to 1550, around there. And uh, okay, yeah, they're sort of armor, jupon, but man, look at those puffy sleeves. Very distinct and iconic to late medieval period and early Renaissance. And I'm sure there is a Bavaria, it's a, it's a Germanic must be. I'm not very good with uh, European geography, my, my apologies. It's probably a distinct name for that type of garment. In the description if you know it, okay? Because uh, it'd be great to add. I just, I couldn't, couldn't find it because I, I found images of this, but you can't like 
do, what does this image look like? Unless, I don't know, so sometimes it's difficult to do the research. So really cool, but it, it is, it does kind of fall into the jupon family kind of garment there. So at a stretch, you could call it a puffy sleeve jupon. All right, so I've done jupons and debards. Next, we're going to a very common type of clothing in uh, late medieval period, okay? This is where we see the transition from the tunics getting a bit shorter. So this type, if, if the tunic is getting to about, you know, knee height and it's buttoned up, it's not a tunic. We would call it a kotahade. And I think that's how, no, I don't, I'm pretty sure that's not how you pronounce it. There's the word kotahade, kotahade. I don't know, but there, so anyway, I'm just gonna have to say it phonetically. Kotahade, kotahade. Very common type of garment, the late medieval period specifically. And uh, again, this is where we see uh, primary garments getting shorter, guys wearing pants far more often because they're wearing shorter kind of tops. And this would be more distinctly identified as a male type of clothing and not a feminine type of clothing. It's probably examples of women wearing it, but more often than not, this is a guy and women more classically wearing dresses in this period. And uh, so the kutahade, okay, thighs, knees, button specifically, tight sleeves, not puffy or big sleeves. There might be examples. Let me know if you've seen them. Very common though, very common. And, uh, and so then the next one that we'll come to is a garment, a type of thing that people wore in the late medieval period and Renaissance. So people sometimes think this is only Renaissance. Uh, no, it is also medieval and that is the doublet. They are the doublet. There are examples of it being a bit longer, coming to the knees. More classically, they end at the waist, all right? This is where the doublet is one of the more classic medieval, late medieval garments of wending at the waist. This is when, you know, it really, like guys wearing long garments, still happened though. You need to understand that guys still wore really long garments in the late medieval period and early Renaissance. Uh, and some look like to be hooplandes and stuff. Like, look at this, you see doublets, right? And uh, for when I say distinction between a dress and a robe, to me, a robe would be an outer, like the, the full most outer garment that you wear over say pants and, or anything like that. I think you could call those robes. And so you could call many types of hooplandes, hooplands, robes. Um, and they look like hooplanders and you call them robes or whatever, but they're still long, they're still dressed like in that sense. And so, and these Bavarian Duke portraits, those are pretty long as well. So long garments still were around, but also short ones. Pants being far more common for guys as well. And uh, another fashion accessory came to accompany these, which also uh, helped encourage either getting the garment short, or if it was long, having a split at the middle to present the codpiece. That's right, the codpiece. And so this is the, uh, speaks about the idea of the ascetic, the fashion of the time. And uh, presenting the crotch for the guys was a, as a sign of masculinity and strength, okay? It wasn't odd, it wasn't weird. And so there are other things that are kind of crotch related in terms of fashion, like the bollock dagger. It's a dagger that's made to look like a, like a schlong, okay? Balls and, a, and a, the, the bollock is the word for balls, right? It's a balls dagger, bullock dagger. That's the most accurate translation you could make for it. Uh, and wearing a dagger right in the middle, right in the middle, hanging down to kind of, you know, reflect something long and hanging in between your legs. What is that supposed to indicate? Again, it was a man. So we see parallels of this, this fashion concept or idea of the crotch being something worth presenting. And I mean, I, I kind of get it. The girls, they get to show their cleavage. They get to present that part of their anatomy. Why can't the guys present their main masculine thing? <laughs> Crotch. <laughs> so we see other, you know, parts of fashion evolving to facilitate this kind of thing. Even if you weren't wearing a cod piece that was huge or it was just a bulge there, or even no, just having that part open, not open so you, you'd still have something covering it, of course, but having that part, you know, presented, short doublets, openings at the front. Very interesting. Now, there is a type of medieval clothing that I have actually not found any examples of them existing in the medieval period. There might be versions of armor and they were just called um, cuirasses or anything, but what I'm referring to is the jerkin, okay? The jerkin is usually a leather garment or could it be a cloth vest? Most of the time, the jerkin is always represented as being leather, dress leather, thin. Uh, and if it was thick enough to function as armor, it was probably just called a cuirass or something like that. But the jerkin from when I've been looking at, the earliest example, like surviving jerkin we have 
is this one right here, and it dates to the Renaissance. All right, I haven't found any examples of the jerkin existing in the medieval period. So that is a type of garment that is misidentified to being a medieval jer vest jacket thing. And it's not. But those are the primary ones. Okay, so let's see if we can do a quick summary. Undergarments, shirt and chemise. You have the blion, you have the precursor to the hoopland, which is the herigat, and then you have the hoopland. Surcoat, kirtle, jupon, tabard, gambeson, monastic scapula, kutahade, and doublet. I think that's everything. Everything that we've mentioned. I actually suspect there are more classic, you know, identifiable medieval garments that I've missed. But those are the ones I've been able to find that are very representative of types of outfits worn in the medieval period. The names, distinctions, differences between the two, and in many instances, the overlaps between these definitions. But they're the primary ones, and uh, been interesting. It's been a long time to try and compile what the names are, what these are, and now there's a more comprehensive video letting you know what they are in a very rambly, long-winded way, which is what I do. Hope you've enjoyed, okay? It was a lot of fun putting this together. And of course, I hope to see you again. Please check out the other video where I talk about just the idea of guys wearing dresses, how it would affect combat and things. I uh, hope to see you there. And until then, farewell. Well.